Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name is Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. Today, my guest is Melissa Brown. She told me when I reached out to her, she's like, why me? She was recommended to me by a friend. And so I was happy to have her. I feel like we actually have a lot in common as far as education. What I was really happy about her is that she was willing to share her testimony and to share about how she knows that she's a child of God and and how that just affects her life and all the things that she does. So it was really nice to have her here in my home and we laughed a lot and I hope you can feel the joy that we shared together. Here's Melissa. I'm in my house today in my in my front room with Melissa Brown. Um, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Yeah, my name is Melissa Brown, and I am from the Mini Goat Clan, and my dad is from the Mud Clan, and both of my grandparents, maternal or grandfathers, maternal and paternal, are from the Salt Clan. Cool. Cool, thank you. Uh, and you have grown up in Salt Lake. Where did you grow up? I actually grew up in Orem, okay, Utah. And so I grew up there my whole life. Um, went to school there, did everything down there in Orem. Cool. So would you share something that you love about your heritage? It can be anything as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Examples, stories, or celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes. Um, Recently, my little sister played a song in our state conference. She played I Love to See the Temple. Um, She plays a saxophone. So she played I Love to See the Temple in our state conference. And as I was sitting there listening to her song, I just thought about how grateful I was for my family and how grateful I am for her. Um, just because like many challenges come in our lives. And I think one of the biggest things is our family to support us. And when I was thinking about this, I thought about families in general and it brought to my mind, my grandma, my, my grandma Brown. And she, every time we'd be, so we'd go down to visit her in Arizona on the reservation in Kaibito and Anywhere we went, whether it was at church or at the trading post, or if someone came to the house, she would always be like, hey, Melissa, come here. You need to meet this person. You're related to her um, on your grandpa's side, or you're related to her by clan. And I would always be like, yeah, like that's that's important to me, but not really important to me because I don't think I really understood what it really meant. Um, but everywhere we went, whether we were up here or anywhere they somehow she would find like we were related to somebody and when I was thinking about that and like thinking about her example it just made me like kind of think about the gospel and how sometimes I think it's easy to forget that we are all brothers and sisters and for me thinking about my grandma and her understanding that we all are brothers and sisters and we are related to somehow or like somehow related whether it's by um just having that same gospel background and like knowing that we're all brothers and sisters and we are all sons and daughters of our heavenly father. And we are all loved no matter where we are or what decisions we're making in this life, but we are all sons and daughters that are loved by our heavenly father and her knowing that connection and knowing that we're all related and we're all on the same path is trying to make it back to our heavenly father is something that I really loved about my heritage and my grandma always finding ways even though it was like 
like whether this is your Nelly or this is your Jay, but like her understanding that we are all one big family and like understanding that through the gospel and knowing that we are all one big family, just trying to make it back home to our heavenly father. And so I, that's what I love about our heritage is how important family is and how that relates to the gospel of us just being sons and daughters of our heavenly father. I love that. That's so great. And that's so foundational. I I mean, like even a, even a child can understand that if, if it's pointed out to them, like they might not just grasp it, but if it's pointed out, they'd be like, oh yeah, I get that now. So yeah, I like that a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so you work in the Salt Lake Valley? Yes. I work in downtown Salt Lake and, currently. Yeah. And how long have you worked there? I've only worked there. It will be one week tomorrow. No way. <laughs> yes. You're brand new. So yeah, I used to work, well, I used to work here in Sandy for um, Larry H. Miller dealerships. Um, I was in the legal department and then I decided to switch. So now I work for a law firm downtown and I've only been there for a week, but it's definitely been like a huge change and a huge blessing for me. And um I don't know. It was like a sudden and it was something that I needed to do. And it was like, I didn't trust myself, but I was like, I trust the Lord and he has a plan for me. So I hope this all works out. And so far, like it's been one of the best experiences for me. And like, it was definitely a change that I needed just because I think the Lord knew more than I did. <laughs> okay. So you're a lawyer. Um, I went to law school. Um, I just haven't taken my test yet. The bar. Yes. <laughs> the bar sucks well like my title is like i'm a licensed paralegal practitioner have you heard of that no -uh. so it's like a lawyer but you can do everything but like represent the client in a court got setting. it yeah taking this leap to a firm was like a big thing and it just i don't know it's it's getting better and i want to go back to get my my phd in english i don't know why it sounds more fun than the law that's a so, lot of reading though I know. and writing yeah it really is but I always enjoyed that and I feel like it's like you're able to express like more of your creativity than anything else yeah. and I think that's what I miss in the law is the creativity part so what did lead you to the law school um when I got home from my mission I ended up getting a job with the state of Utah and I ended up working in policies and procedures and like a whole bunch of different state programs. And I ended up at the primary children's hospital and doing all of their medical policies and procedures for children who had like very big medical problems, like whether it was cancer or they were in accidents or anything like that, like any sort of like very critical um, kind of conditions that they had there. And when I was there, um, something just kind of was like, oh, you should go to law school because this is going to be able to help people more. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, well, I guess, I guess I will follow that prompting. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up going to law school and that's just kind of how it happened. And I just tried to trust that plan. And I mean, I did it and I don't know why, why I other like than I was to this day, other than I was told to do it. So I did it. And at the time, I think it just really helped me because I needed something like that at that time. Yeah. Cause I was just like in this like rough spot of like coming home from my mission and trying to like, just really figure out what I needed to do in my life. And that was at least a small direction that like, or prompting that I had that I needed to follow. And so I did it and here I am. <laughs> so I totally get that one too. Cause I don't know why I was supposed to do law school. Yeah. So I did it and I still feel blessed by it because I had many connections, um, that are like many experiences with like classmates and having friends at that time. And, it was kind of like during the time of COVID. So I felt like it, I was still able to like have like socialization, but at the same time in a weird way, it did help me build my testimony about our savior, Jesus Christ. Cause I, in my class, there was only like three members wow. of the 
of the church, three members. and In your whole class? In my whole class. There were only three of us. And what? in one of my classes, the teacher was very much against the church. And he was talking about, like, how horrible... Um, one of the, one of our leaders were in one of his talks or something that one of the leaders said, and he's like, yeah, they use the word excommunication and they kicked everything out. And me, because I had so many years as Relief Society president, I said, oh, well, actually they took the word excommunication out. Um, like they use a different word, disfellowship instead, because you can always repent and come back to our savior, Jesus Christ. Like they never just kick you out or anything like that like there's always a way to go back and like there's always like there's always open arms for someone to return back to the gospel and to return back to the teachings of our savior jesus christ and um i think that kind of took him back because i don't think he knew that and then in like a weird way I was able to like bear my testimony to my class and afterwards the other two people that are members of the church in my class like text me and they were like, Melissa, I'm so grateful you said something because we were both so scared, but you were like so brave and you shared like your testimony in this class and our teacher didn't know what to say after that. And I was, and I remember driving home just being like, and I think I talked about the priesthood too. Um, when I was talking to my professor in front of my whole class and I remember driving home after this, just being so grateful, knowing that like we have the priesthood and that I have parents who taught me these teachings and like I had that relief, the relief society experience and had this knowledge to be able to be like, Oh, well actually let me go ahead and share this with you. Like, this is really how it is. Like, our heavenly father is so loving and like he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, so that we can all repent and like, we don't need to be perfect. And like, there's never going to be a moment when we're going to be turned away from trying to come to Christ. Like he's always there with his arms open to accept us no matter like how we are or who we are. And so I look back at like my experience and I'm like, okay, in some ways I'm like, I don't know why I came here, but in some weird way, it's definitely like blessed my life and helped me build that testimony and realize like the truthfulness that we have. Yeah. If that makes any sense. That's so great. Like I still don't know why I went, but here we are. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What a great story. I know. I remember going home and I was crying to my mom about this and I was like, Oh my God, I'm such like a little nugget, but, but yeah. So I think like going and getting like my education has been more, of like an experience for me that I needed to learn and put in situations where I can have like those testimony building experiences. So that's so great. Yeah. Where'd you serve your mission? Um, I served my mission in Chihuahua, Mexico. Uh huh. Yeah. And was that a good experience for you? Was it, it was a really good experience. Um, I was kind of surprised that I got my calling to Chihuahua, Mexico, first of all, um, because I remember turning, well, one, I didn't tell my parents I was going to serve a mission. So I just started filling out the paperwork and I met, remember meeting with my Bishop and getting everything started. And I didn't tell my parents at all. And then I was about to like submit my papers. And I remember telling my mom like downstairs and I was like, Hey mom, I need to talk to you really fast. And she was like, you're going to go on a mission, huh? I just know already. And I started bawling and I was like, how did you know? Like I literally started this process without telling anybody. And she was crying and I was crying because I was older when I went. I was, I forgot how old I was, like 24 or something. And um, I was about to like go to school again and like get my other degrees. And um, I just remember feeling like there was someone waiting for me that I needed to teach and it was like this I don't know I had like this dream that it was like this old lady in like a wheelchair and I was like I gotta go on a mission for her I have to find her and I gotta I, ha I just have to serve this mission and so I ended up turning in my papers and going on my mission and I remember praying one night just being like Heavenly Father I want to speak Spanish but I don't want to go far away I want to be close enough to like the United States where I'm like 
still close to my family, but not too far from my family. And at this time I had like so many cousins out on missions. So I was like, that would be great if you could put me in like a mission with one of my cousins. Like that would be amazing. (laughs) And so I remember praying for this and I was like, no, there's no way that would ever happen. Like there's no way that would happen. And when I got my mission call, I went to Chihuahua, Mexico and um, I had a cousin serving there and Chihuahua was like on the border of the United States. So I'm like super far from home, but, um, it w- and it was Spanish speaking. So I was still close. So I feel like heavenly father really came through for me on that and he listened to my prayers. He answered everything. And not only that, but when I got to Chihuahua, like lots of the like culture and just like the culture is pretty similar to like native American culture. And it just felt like I was at home with them. And um, my cousin that served with me in my mission, our parents are actually siblings. So our dads are brothers and our moms are sisters. Oh, you're double cousins. Yeah. So they call it in Spanish. It's called primos hermanos. And so with the area, the first area that I was in, he was in there right before that. And so I feel like sometimes he was like, he planted all these seeds for me. And then I came in and just kind of finished some of the work that he did. Um, and lots of the ward members were like, Elder Brown was here when he found out that you were coming here and he was crying and he was so excited to see you. And, um, but I feel like that was such a blessing to have my cousin there with me. Cause I definitely had like a hard time, like learning the language and, Um, I felt like I saw him in all of the right times that I needed him, like in our training meetings and, um, just like throughout the mission experience and during Christmas, it was like I was with my family, even though I was far away from my family of having him there with me. And it's just a reminder that our heavenly father, like knows exactly what we need and he'll answer our prayers. Um, when we ask him. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was a really good experience. <laughs> That's so awesome. Yeah. It was such a good time. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, I would definitely go back to my mission and um, just to be with all of the people and to like see them come to church and see the efforts that they put forth to come to church just because like sometimes they would travel 30 minutes or like an hour just to come to church and jump on a bus. And I remember coming home and just being like, wow, mom, like there's so many people that sacrifice so many things just to come to church. And we just like live like two seconds away from a church and like five minutes from a temple. And like, I don't think we realize how blessed we are to have that when there's so many people out there that sacrifice a lot more to live the gospel. Yeah. So you grew up in Orem, but most of your family, like your extended families still on the reservation or like border towns yeah so my grandma lives in on the reservation in Kaibito still um with some of my aunts and uncles and some of my cousins still live out there um then I have some family in Page so just that kind of area like Page, Lachii, um Kaibito that kind of area just right there yeah and how often would you go visit them um, I'm actually going this weekend oh, that's to nice. go see my grandma and to see my family down there. Um, but we, we used to go a lot more often, like during the holidays and during Christmas, but recently it's been probably just every few months, but COVID definitely threw it off because like the reservation was like on lockdown. And so it made it really hard to go down there. And like me and my mom went down there to drop stuff off at my grandma's house during COVID and then we came right back. <laughs> so we didn't stay down there. We just dropped stuff off at her door and then we came back. And But we used to go down there a lot more, but we try to go down as often as we can. That's nice. But they usually come up here. They like coming up here. Some of like my aunts and uncles, their kids are up here. So they'll come up here to visit us and then we'll try to go down there. But So, um... You were telling me that you're a longtime Relief Society leader. Yes. <laughs> how how has uh, that affected your life? It's definitely blessed my life and like challenged me a lot. Because um, I think I was talking to you earlier about how I came home from my mission. And 
a week after I was called back as a Relief Society president. I think that's nuts. And <laughs> it is a little crazy. And I just remember being having a hard time transitioning back to like regular life and not knowing exactly what I was doing right off my mission. And then I had like over like I had like 200 sisters that I had to learn. Uh, I had to learn their names and their needs and everything like that. Um, however, I feel like the mission kind of like prepared me for some of that and to jump into that. But I think more than anything, um, I feel like the Lord always gives me things that I feel like I can't handle, but he always finds a way for me to handle them. Cause in that moment I was having such a hard time, like transitioning from my mission. And I didn't think that I could like be able to support 200 sisters in our ward. And so I, but it, I took on the challenge anyway and somehow was able to focus more on the sisters than myself. And I think that really helped me kind of focus more on their needs and realizing these are sisters that really need me and knowing that Heavenly Father will give me the strength and the knowledge and everything that I needed to be able to help them. And I think that made my transition easier sort of coming back from my mission and then it just really helped me share what I learned in my mission with them and kind of made my life easier through a hard situation if that makes sense totally yeah like people that are um on a like in a leadership position like a bishop or something when they are released then they have that like my my husband was bishop for a while and when he was released he's he experienced the bishop blues like yeah you lose that mantle and it's a loss and so yeah. having something for you to go straight into to fill that loss I'm sure was was helpful yeah that was definitely helpful and even after being released after like my six years of being Relief Society president I always thought like I'd have a break of some sort and be like, oh, everything, I get to live like a normal person. Like I just get to go to church and listen. But then I got like a calling right away. And I always feel like Heavenly Father knows me. He's like, Melissa, if you don't have nothing to do, you are, I don't know what decisions you're going to make, but you need to have a calling. And um, there's so many people. And I think this goes along with anybody and like, There's lots of callings that I think we overlook, like ministering and just like even like the smallest one of I don't even know, like a small calling. But I I think every calling is like very important. But no matter what calling we have, um, that's what our Heavenly Father wants us to share, because there's these talents that we have. And um, he's trying to develop those by giving us these callings and reaching out to those people that maybe perhaps we wouldn't be able to reach out to if we didn't have the calling. Um, And at the same time, like reaching out also blesses us in like the things that we need. Cause I didn't know at the time that I needed those 200 sisters when I was relief society president to fill um, like that emptiness that I felt coming home from a mission and like just missing all of the love that I had from being a missionary in Chihuahua and coming home and not having the members anymore but like it was filled with these 200 sisters that I got to, that I had the opportunity to serve. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so at what point in your life do you remember having your own testimony of the Book of Mormon? I remember when I was in I played basketball when I was in high school. And it was my junior year. And every single year we get to go down to Phoenix for um, like the Nike tournament that they have down there. And it was towards the end of the year. And I remember Gordon B. Hinckley was the prophet at that time. And he challenged all of us to read the Book of Mormon by the end of the year. I don't know if you remember that. I do. Remember but that. he challenged all of us to read it. And it was during Christmas time. And like the year was almost up. And I remember like while all of my teammates were having fun at the pool and like playing games. And, and I remember sitting in the middle of the hotel. It was a really pretty hotel that had like these gardens. And I remember sitting there with my 
Book of Mormon finishing Moroni. And I remember sitting there and like thinking, wow, this book is so great. And like, and I remember sitting there and it was just like quiet and serene and like just finishing it and just knowing that it was true at such a young age and knowing that it was that everything that I felt was like the love that my heavenly father had for me and that this book was just not a book, but it was like a guide to be happy and a guide to return back home and just like a guide to like how to live your covenants and how to be happy. And, and I just remember sitting there knowing that it was true and just feeling like super grateful um, that we were given that challenge. And I just did it because I was challenged to do it by the prophet. But at the end of the day, like I think back at that all the time of just knowing at that moment that it was true and just knowing that that book would bless my life throughout, throughout my whole life. Yeah. That's so cool. Are there any stories or scriptures, scripture passages that have um, really affected your life? Yes. And I, I came prepared to share it because like I told you, I didn't memorize. I don't have any of them memorized, but I think like the story or like the scripture story of Samuel, the Lamanite always, I came home like talking about this story just because I don't know, it just really stuck out to me um, with Samuel the Lamanite because he went to call repentance. And um, I'll read the scripture because it's in Helaman 13 and Helaman 13, 3. And like Samuel the Lamanite didn't know exactly what to say, right? And so he, but then it says in Helaman 13, 3, it says, but behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him that he should return again and prophesy unto the people whatsoever things should come into his heart. Um, And that part just really like stuck out to me because I just think about how we have to prepare our hearts to receive the voice of the Lord and exactly what did Samuel do so that he would be prepared to hear that voice and that his heart was prepared to receive whatsoever thing that the Lord put in there. And so I continually think about that and like, how can I prepare myself to continually hear the voice of my Lord every single day? Um, and that takes a lot of little things like reading your scriptures, saying your prayers. And um, I think one big thing that I'm learning right now is, is when I get a prompting to act quickly, um, whether as long as it's like a good prompting to do something because the Lord trusts me to put that thought or that person in my mind to reach out to them because they need that. And I'm part of an instrument or I'm an instrument in the Lord's hands to do his work. Um, and so I'm always continually trying to prepare my heart to receive those promptings. And like, sometimes I'm not the best at it, but it's continually like a learning curve for me. And like, what can I do to always be prepared? Are you in a singles ward or a family a family ward? I'm in a singles ward in the Spanish ward. In yeah. A single Spanish ward. Yeah, which is definitely humbling because my Spanish is not the best, so I speak a lot of Spanglish, and um, it's definitely a humbling experience every single Sunday going to church because I obviously do not have the best the best accent, nor do I conjugate super well super fast, and so. It's humbling to talk to all these like sisters and brothers who like speak perfectly and they just ha- kind of have to like handle my really bad accent. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but yeah, it's definitely a humbling experience. And sometimes I just look at them cause I don't know what they said. Cause they have accents. Like the Dominican accent is just like so hard for me to understand. And I'm praying half of the time that I understand them. Yeah. Huh? So, so how many accents would you say are in your ward there's probably at least like three or four that I hear and some of them are really fast and some don't finish like the Spanish all the way it's just how the accent is and like some of them use different words for different things and and I'm sometimes just very confused and I just say yes to everything so I (laughs) sometimes I don't know what I got myself into but (laughs) that's funny Oh no. But yeah. 
how do you study the come follow me every week with being in a singles ward? I do it on my own. Uh huh. We don't have, or at least our ward doesn't do like any come follow me, like study That's groups. That's what I'm or, wondering. Yeah, we don't do any like study groups or anything like that. I just do everything on my own. Do you like listen to podcasts? Do you listen? I do. To- I do. Um, I listen to podcasts. So I do all of the reading and everything within the manual. And then I do Don't Miss This by David Butler and Emily Freeman. And then I also list. So I listen to that one. And then I also listen to another one. His name is Stephen Scott. The other one with his wife. Those two podcasts and like on YouTube, I watch the videos just because like, I feel like they both see things differently and they hit both like different point of views. And so I get to learn like one from David Butler and then one from him. And I like, when I used to teach, I would use both. And so, and like for myself, I just learned so much from those two podcasts that I would, that I like listen to. Plus I really enjoy both of them. They both have like really good stories. They're very like personal, which I really enjoy. I do too. I brought that up to um, to prep you for the next question. So we just recently had a Jeremiah uh, reading assignment, and one of the one of the scriptures was about us being clay in the potter's hand. So, how have you felt that you have been shaped and molded by the the Savior, our perfect Potter? I feel like I'm still being molded or perhaps it's like a continuing molding. I don't know if it will like ever stop, which I hope it doesn't stop because um, that means I'm just continually like growing in my testimony and my, go- in the gospel. Um, but I think many times he's put lots of challenges in my way and um, that I never thought that I'd be able to complete um, such as going on a mission or such as being Relief Society president or trying to go to school and being Relief Society president at the same time and just like some challenges that my family had faced while I was Relief Society president and in school. And, um, and I feel like during that time, Heavenly Father was, he's, he's always trusted me, but he's really helped me learn how to trust myself. Um, and having that confidence in myself and trying to help me through those challenges of me being like, Melissa, yes, you can make this, you can do this. Like you have so much more faith than you think that you do and continually like helping me realize that and like molding me into this woman of faith, even though sometimes it's hard for me to think that I am a woman of faith, but he continually reminds me of that by the challenges and he's helping me like, he just helps he just helps me or he reminds me that I do have that faith inside of me, even though sometimes I don't believe it. That's a good answer. So what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Um, I cycle. So I ride my bike. I have a road bike. So I cycle all the mountains while I was driving here. I was looking at that guardsman's pass that we had cycled. I did not make it to the top. I actually cried. (laughs) And so I turned around and came down. I had like this really bad experience the week before. And so I kind of had like this trauma from it, but yeah, I cycle all the time. So I cycle like all the mountains, like Alpine loop. I do Springville. Um, we've done, Oh, not, this isn't guardsman's pass. What's this loop called that goes over Draper? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, this road, the, the road that goes by Draper up by like the temple and that goes over out to Alpine over is what street. I was thinking about. Uh-huh. That's the one we just barely did. And I didn't make it over that mountain. Garsman's Pass is in Park City. I did make that one. I, well, I made up most of it before it started raining. Yeah. So I, I rode bike. Um, I go to Zumba. I go to high fitness. Um, what else do I do? I do. I go to kickboxing class. I go to water aerobics with my friends. Um, I feel like just lots of my hobbies are exercising. 
that's good because I'm a couch potato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, like, I, I, me and my friends, we like, we like K-pop, K-dramas, like BTS. Do you know who uh-uh. they are? They're like this big K-pop group and like black pink and we get together and we watch their concerts in Korea. Yeah. So that's like the fun things that we do and... I mean, like I was telling you, me and my friends get together to go to Starbucks to get pink drinks. <laughs> and that's like our fun. And I watch movies with them and like all the chick flicks that you can think of. And yeah, during the summertime, I like to golf. It's awesome. If you could do something really awesome, like bucket list awesome, what would you what, do, what would you want to do? If I could do anything, I think right now it'd probably just like go skydiving or like, have you seen those people who like jump off mountains and they wear just like the little raccoon oh suits my gosh, that's or terrifying. the squirrel suits? Yeah. I would probably want to do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just like jump off a mountain and I like, if I make it, I make it. If I don't, <laughs> then I guess it was my time. <laughs> 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 but like, I would want to do that in like. Banff National Park that's in Canada because it's like super pretty um but yeah I probably like yeah the squirrel suit like jumping off a mountain of some sort I don't know why that comes to mind but I've watched videos and I mean if they can make it I'd probably be okay too so I don't know is there someone from from history or church history even or scriptures that you would like to meet who is it and why if i were to meet anybody i think it would just be the prophet joseph smith i would have lots of questions for him and just i think his story is just just the story of joseph smith is just a huge testimony builder um i always talked about this with my companion and my mission cuz i'd always be like i guess some people worry about when they have questions But I'm always reminded that with the story of Joseph Smith, he started out with questions. And lots of my friends nowadays are like, I have questions about the gospel. I I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I always tell them, no, it's a good thing to have questions because that means you're looking for answers. And when you're looking for answers with a good intent and like this desire, then our Heavenly Father will answer that. And so I'd always like to like meet Joseph Smith and ask him about these questions and um, just ask him about some of the things that, that he went through, such as when Martin Harris asked him for like those 116 pages of the Book of Mormon and multiple times the Lord was like, no, 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 no. And then finally the Lord was like, okay, fine. Like you do what you want to do. And then he kind of learned from that experience. And I think looking at that story and just my life recently, Um, I think many times Heavenly Father was like, Melissa, don't do that. Melissa, don't do that. Um, Melissa, don't do that (laughs) over and over. But then eventually he's like, okay, well, I told you now you can make your own decision and like have me practice my own agency. He did what he could and I make those decisions and then I learn from it. And now I look back and I'm like, oh, that's what he was teaching. And it kind of helps me think about how... I need to be more trusting of my heavenly father and like listen to those small little promptings because sometimes the the circumstances or the consequences of my decisions um, aren't the best, but I can look back and learn from it and know that really like heavenly father does have the best plan for me, even though sometimes I try to like sway my own way, but he really does have the best um set aside for me and I just have to trust him more in the future with with my life in his hands or love that answer I have one final question for you what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel um I thought a lot about this question um in the tribe of Israel and I brought this letter with me because I was talking to my mom about it in this letter when I read that question when you had shared it with me, um, my, my mom's foster mom would always tell us you're of the tribe of Israel. Like you're a special people. And I was like, when I was small, I was like, I don't really understand that. And she wrote this letter, um, 
just about the tribe of Israel and my mom being a, her foster daughter and just like having, she's adopted um, some Native American kids. And so she wrote this letter to her family and she shared some scriptures in there about being of the house of Israel. And I just wanted to share part of it because I think um, being a part of house of Israel is a huge blessing in my life. And um, just something that I think I'm slowly coming to understand of how it really is a blessing and how sacred it is to be the house of Israel, knowing that we have a purpose and we have this line that we're a part of to help with our heavenly father's plan. Um, but there's a scripture that's in this letter that my mom would always share with us that my grandma, my grandma Ellis shared with us. And it has a scripture from, um, Mormon seven, and it says, know ye that ye are of the house of Israel, that ye are remnant of the seed of, of Jacob. Therefore ye are numbered among the people of the first covenant. And it continues to go on. But I think just that first sentence just really struck me and has always struck me knowing that we're numbered and that we're part of this first covenant and that we really do, um, play a huge part in, um, the gathering of Israel. And sometimes I feel like I'm very small and I'm just one person. Um, but when I look back at that, knowing that the book of Mormon was written like precisely for, for me and it contains all of those blessings and, um, contains all of the information about the covenants that we have to receive all of those blessings and how, when I live righteously, then I can help our Heavenly Father and His work here upon this earth because I am that part of the the tribe of Israel. And it's just something special to me. And um, just knowing that I have like that special, <laughs> I don't know, just like that special um, witness of our Heavenly Father and that of those promises that He has for us. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for being here and and laughing with me and sharing with me. And... <laughs> no, I'm happy to be here. This week, I actually heard a lot of good talks. Three of the best ones. One was probably the best plan of salvation talk I've ever heard. It was at a funeral on Saturday. And then the other two awesome talks were at, at church on Sunday. Uh, the, the second talk was about following the prophet. And it was such a good talk. She, my friend Deborah was the one that gave the, the talk. And she just, it was just so good and powerful. The one that I want to share with you was the first talk that we had about temples. And it was so good. He talked about all different things. But the thing that just stuck in my head was the part where my friend, brother Justin Stewart, talked about how, and I've heard this before, but he talked about how the temple is not for perfect people, but for us to become perfected. Okay? I've heard that before, but he, he talked about how when he was in the bishopric and he got to do temple recommend interviews, most all the youth said, yeah, I'm worthy at the end when he asks if, if, if when we're asked if we feel worthy enough to enter the temple. And he said, but on the opposite end, most adults pause and think, uh, yeah, I think I'm worthy enough. And I think I do that too. I, But I think one of the things that I feel like Heavenly Father is teaching me is that I am trying. I am trying every day. And that's what repentance for is daily repentance. And President Nelson has recently said to find joy in daily repentance. Joy in it. 
because then we can enter the temple knowing that we're trying. We're trying. Anyway, that's my thought for you today. I am so grateful for President Nelson. I am so grateful for the plan of salvation. And I am so grateful for temples. And I hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.